Well, hello everyone and welcome to another edition of the DC Capstone Report. It's great to be back again. Uh, we're going to continue this weekly podcast from Alabama football. We're glad to have you. Uh, just uh, last week was fan day on Saturday and so we have a lot of great content on the website. So I just want to tell you to go to our website, dccapstonereport.com. Lance has done a fantastic job of posting up some wonderful pictures and videos. If you want to follow me on Twitter at DavidCott50, that's D-A-V-I-D-C-O-T 50. Uh, I've retweeted a lot of the videos and team pictures and things that took place from Fan Day. So there's a lot of content for you. Also, for all of our listeners out there, if you go to the DCCapstoneReport.com page, Lance has posted some wallpapers for your cell phones that have the pictures and the Alabama schedules on there. So you're welcome to get those. So uh, it is a, just a great day that we get to, to start with a fan day and look forward to Alabama football playing again. So today on the podcast, we're gonna, in our first segment, we're going to take a look or review of fan day uh, and kind of all that went on there, what, we, what our observations are from that. In our second segment, we're going to take a look at our coordinators. Uh, fan day is the first time that we get to hear from our coordinators, Pete Golding and, and Steve Sarkeesian. So we're going to talk about them and what they had to say. Uh, what their philosophies are. We learned a little bit about that. In our third and final segment, we're going to continue our highlighting of a different position on the field. We're still on defense, and this week we, we move to the defensive backfield. EC Capstone Report is featured each Tuesday morning on Tide 102.9, The Morning Blitz with Martin Houston. You can listen live at Tide1029.com. Well, here in our first segment, we're going to take a look and uh, review Fan Day. First of all, I want, to, I want to give a shout out to Lance Shores, my partner in this podcast. He's the one making all this possible with the with the video with the video and the audio recordings. Lance did a great job attending Fan Day and getting the, uh, some wonderful videos and some pictures posted. Just the countless numbers on our DC Caps on Report page there for you to view. So, I uh, just appreciate Lance and all he does to make this podcast possible. Uh, well, Fan Day, I think, was is something everybody wanted to see arrive. It starts and marks the start of Alabama football for the 2019 campaign. And just my observation, just general observation is, I think we're in for a great year uh, in 2019. I heard some wonderful things that were shared by uh, Coach Saban and the other coordinators and, and about the team and about going forward. So one thing, one of my observations that after all the talk was mentioned in the in the it was mentioned by Coach Saban, something that really stuck out to me. And I think his, his quote was that this was the, uh, the best conditioned team coming out of summer that he's had at Alabama in his tenure there. And, and I, want to, I want to tell you what he, what, what he was saying there. I think if you got to read between the lines, and my analysis of that was he was saying just more than what their conditioning was. You remember at the end of last year, he questioned the commitment of the players uh, and, and distractions and the loss that we had in the final championship games. And he said we need to get back to the Alabama factor. We need to get back to the Alabama process, the Alabama factor. And so when he says coming out of the summer, uh, well, this is the best conditioned team uh, that we've seen coming out of summer practice. I think that says a lot of great about our strength coach. We have a great strength and conditioning coach in Scott Cochran. And, you know, I'm – one of his biggest supporters. I think he's the reason that we're so successful at Alabama. Uh, and Scott Cochran, is, I, I think he's very valuable to the team. But, you know, Scott Cochran didn't change any of his philosophies. He, he still pushed him to the limit. He still led him in, in some great, uh, uh, great conditioning exercises. I think the difference here is the buy-in from this team. I think they've gotten the message. They understand they need to get back to the Bama factor. They understand that they left on the field last year leaving. They didn't want to have that taste in their mouth again. And they come back with a better uh, attitude, uh, a buy-in of the process. And I think that's what's made the difference. They've bought into what Scott Cochran is doing, and therefore they come out of this well-conditioned. Case in point, I think that points to later leadership. And you don't have to look any further than your leader, your quarterback, Tua Tagovailoa himself. Uh, and looking at him and seeing him this year from last year, you, 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 you know, a, know a marked difference in his physical appearance. He, in talking and his speaking, I think he says he took off about 18 to 20 pounds of fat and he put back on about 18 pounds of muscle. Uh, and you can just tell the difference in his body. Well, that comes from commitment to the off-season workouts and program. And I believe that leadership starts at the top and then that transitions down to all the other players on the team. So I really believe that through uh, 
uh, Tua Tagovailoa's leadership has improved. Uh, I think the players have bought in. I think both sides of the ball, defense and offense, don't want to have a repeat of last season. They want to see this season through to a championship. And they know that the only way to do that is to get back to that Alabama factor, that Alabama process. And I think Coach Saban's statement of, hey, this is the best conditioned team I've had coming out, I'm very pleased where they are. That's just putting his stamp of approval of, hey, guys, thank you for buying in. we got to keep going. we got to look forward to the next, uh, to, uh, to the next uh, part of this journey. I think another observation from, from what Coach was talking about, he talked about we're not going to look at the – uh, we're going to, have to look at what we do on the field. Our, our success is going to be measured on what we do now. And I think he is going to be really focusing in on the practices, really getting better. A long time ago, uh, a, a wise coach of mine said this. He said, practice doesn't make perfect, David. You've always heard that practice makes perfect. That's not true. The, the truth is perfect practice makes perfect. In other words, if you don't do it right in per- practice on the little things, then you won't do it right in the game. So I think another part of that Bama factor is making these practices count. I think that's what uh, Coach uh, Saban is going to be focusing on as we go through these practices leading up to the first game against Duke there in the Chick-fil-A kickoff classic in Atlanta. So that was another a good observation of mine uh, of, of what of philosophies. Another thing that I observed was not only the condition of the team, but I looked uh, at the offensive line and I saw – just a mass of players. We're talking six, seven, three hundred pounds across the board. Six, 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 seven, three hundred pounds, and a lot of these players, and just the massive uh, uh, bulk that they put on. Uh, and and I believe that's another way of getting back to the Alabama factor. I think we're going to run the ball more this year. I think that's a philosophy of Coach Sarkeesian that I'll talk more about in the second segment. But running the ball, I think in the past. At least the past two years, I don't believe we've had an offensive line that's been able to impose our will on the other team. In other words, have an offensive line that can line up head-to-head, helmet-to-helmet, and know that you're going to knock them off the ball and get you that one to two yard that you need at any given time in a game to keep a, keep a drive going. And I believe that we're getting back to that. I've seen this, the physical specimens of these, uh, of these players uh, the young players, for example, such as Evan Neal, who's, who's coming in like at 6'7", 360 pounds. you got the transfer from Florida State, Landon Dickerson, getting off the bus. He looked like the real deal with his, uh, with his frame, 6'6", 300-something pounds. And then you got the bookends and Leatherwood and Wills improving their positions. you got Chris Owen at center. you got Matt Walmack, 6'7", uh, three, over 300 pounds. And, and Emil Ikeor, uh 6'6". So all of those from across the board – that offensive line, to me, passed the, 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 just the look test, the eye test. They passed that test as the, getting back that physical nature of the Alabama football team. So I, I thought that was a, really good. And looking at the at players, another thing I thought was really good is we looked like we're really healthy uh, coming in. There was only three players that I know of right now that Coach talked about. Uh, one, Nigel Nod, a defensive back. Uh, played in reserve, played on some special teams last year. He's dealing with a medical issue, undisclosed, not sure what it is, but it looks like uh, some of my sources told me this week that after they're close to him, said that he'll be back cleared to perform soon in, the, in upcoming practices. And you got Miller Forstall. He's dealing with a foot injury where he had some surgery over the, over the uh, summer, and they're holding him back a little bit. Uh, managing his game, but it looks like he'll be back uh, before the first game and, and be able to play and con- contribute. And LeBron Ray is nursing an injury uh, as well. He's uh, on a track to come back in a week or two, Coach Saban says. So doesn't like any large uh, large amount of injuries that's keeping us out. Uh, in the injury front, it was really good to see Terrell Lewis in this first practice. In, in the fan day practice and the two practices that have been since that, on uh, on uh, Monday and, and, and uh, yesterday, on Monday yesterday, uh, it looked like that practice yesterday. He really had that explosive step. And Coach Saban said something about him that really caught my eye in his opening remarks. He said Terrell Lewis is not only 100%, he's better today than he was before he got injured. Uh, so that's it. that's exciting to hear as well. So I think an overall picture of the fan day review, uh, it, it was great to show out there. Uh, the team, well prepared, uh, coming out good uh, uh, out of the uh, off-season workouts in great shape bulked up, ready to play, uh, ready to follow the Bama factor and the, and the follow the process, and freedom of injuries and those that were injured coming back from injuries, all those bode well. 
Of course, it's just the helmets and shorts. And when you put on the pads and strap on the gear and line up, uh, it could be a lot different going in. But right now, this Alabama team, as a fan day and as these early practices, passes the eye test that we're set up to have a great year in 2019. Well, in our second segment today, we're going to take a look at our coordinators. It's always good at, on fan day you get to hear from the coordinators. And this year, our offensive coordinator is Steve Sarkeesian, and our defensive coordinator is Pete Golding. Now, as far as Sarkeesian is concerned, he's had a stint here at Alabama before. Uh, when he talked, he talked about how great it was to come back to Alabama. He, he had a couple of years in the NFL. But the opportunity for him to come back to Alabama in a place he's familiar with and, and learn from Coach Saban just was too much for him to pass up. And uh, he talked about uh, the, the, the working for Coach Saban and how, how great of an experience it was. Uh, and he really focused in on that, uh, on, on, you know, on learning from him and learning the process and sticking to the process. It looks like what we uh, talked about earlier, we're not going to uh, completely abandon the RPOs. It looks like they're going to add to that things that Sarsidian does well. And he reiterated uh, in his speech uh, that his philosophy is he likes to run the ball. So run the ball to set up the pass. And I've always said if the, if the linemen know you're running the ball, they block better in that position. And I think we've, as I've said in the first segment, we've developed a line this year that if it comes together, first and second team bulked up enough to really impose our will on the other players to get that run game up to a higher level. I'm anticipating our run game could produce 2,000-yard rushers this year in Najee Harris and and Brian Robinson and Trey Sanders could possibly not be too far behind, uh, running behind this line. Of course, you got Jerome Ford as well. So I think the the the, the running game is in good hands, and that is a philosophy that Coach Coach uh, uh, Sarkeesian talked about to run run the ball except the pass. Now that by no means means we're going to be abandoning the pass. We got Tua Tagovailoa, who's got a, is a great passer, uh, and he's teaching according to Sarkeesian. He, he know, he's known him a long time. He, he, he likes what he sees in, in, in Tua, and he's teaching him the progression reads to read all of the, uh, the players. And why not? That, when you have the four uh, opportunities to play four wide receivers, uh, the red set that Alabama calls it, the red set, if you have an opportunity to play four wide receivers, why not read the whole progression and look at all four of them? Uh, one of them is going to be open on any given play. So with the athleticism, we got it wide out, the great quarterback that we have, running the game to set up the, the passing plays. I believe we're, this year we're, we're, we're poised to have an overall uh, very good offensive strategy uh, with, uh, with, with uh, Coach uh, Sarkeesian in place over the offense. He's excited about leading, and I'm excited about what he's going to do with it. Pete Golding had an opportunity to chance to speak, and his, he took, took advantage of that in, in telling – uh, why he came here. He came here, he said, because Coach Saban was an icon. And uh, when you want to learn defense, you want to learn from the best. And, and the, one, the one thing he loves about Alabama football is that learning from the master defensive mind of Coach Saban and that process. The philosophy is a little different. He said the terminology and the things you do is, a little, is about is the same, but the philosophy is different on how you get those players in positions to make plays. So I, I, I thought really good about what he was what he was talking about. I believe we're going to be aggressive. We're going to try to get to the quarterback. We're going to try to be, impose our will uh, and stop the get off the field on third downs. And that's something that we need to improve over last year on. So I look forward to seeing our defense perform under under Coach Golding. One thing he did mention that I found was very intriguing when I asked the question. He talked about Joshua McMillan. You know, Joshua McMillan coming in to that linebacker spot. He said this, and I made this observation before on the podcast, but. He said Joshua Millen on the field uh, because he has a mind, intelli intelligence, and, and the academic verbiage for football. How to how to and how he makes all the other ten players on the field better, uh, and that that's a, that shows a performance of a good leader. Now he's been in the system a long time, knows everything, knows how to get people in the right positions, and he and Coach Golden said I've told uh, Josh that he's not the best athlete. There's others behind him that got better athleticism, better or faster, better skill sets, but he has the overall total package to get Alabama and make everybody else around him better. Uh, so I, I think that that's really good to, uh, indication that Josh might be able to be starting, uh, you know, opposite Dylan Moses in that middle linebacker field. So I was glad to hear that, that Coach Golden appreciated the, the experience that McMillan brings to the game. So overall, I think uh, hearing from Coach Sarkeesian and hearing from uh, Coach Golden uh, lets me believe that we're in a good position with our coordinators going forward. They're, 
they have a good philosophy that mar- that marriage well with uh, uh, Coach uh, Saban's philosophy. And I don't think there will be any problems like with last year with any distractions or dissensions among coordinators or that sort of thing. I think with Sarkeesian and Golden, they're going to really – uh, maintain that company line of getting back to the Alabama factor, getting back to the process, and make the other team want to quit, not want to play Alabama. So I look forward to seeing what these two old coordinators can put together uh, right as we lead up to that first game against Duke. Well, going into our third segment today, we want to focus on another position on the team that we highlight. Uh, we're going through a preview of all the positions on the team uh, leading up to our first game. Uh, and this, you know, we've already highlighted the defensive line. We looked at, our, in the second week, we looked at our linebackers. So we're going to stay on the defensive side of the ball. And we're going to take a look at our defensive backs. I think uh, coming off of the game against Clemson, we were a little exposed in our defensive backs. I think we'd had some injuries that left us thin at that position. And we were able to, uh, Clemson was able to pick apart some of the plays uh, of our defensive backs just because of the positions that they were in. Uh, and so I, I really believe that was a, that's a place that we had to do a, an increase to and, and uh, up, up, kind of up our game there in defensive backfield. And I really believe that that's something that's happened over the, over the course of this offseason. That, that we got some great players coming back from injury that I think that will be able to help out. And we got some other players that's really learned, some young players coming in uh, that can, that can uh, participate as well. It looks like across the board, though, Trayvon Diggs, a senior, coming back, number seven, cornerback, coming back from an injury. If he can stay healthy, uh, it's probably going to be the best cover corner that we've got coming in at that, that position. On the other side, you got Patrick Sertain, a sophomore. He was picked on a little bit his freshman year, but I think he's learned a lot of that from, from any, any mistakes that he may have made then, and it's really good that he played so much and got so much experience coming into his sophomore year. Uh, to be able to uh, to improve, I think he he let we he, opportunity for him to play corner opposite uh, Diggs is going to be really good at our corners. Uh, at our at our safety positions, you got Xavier McKinney, uh, number fifteen, strong safety, hard hitter, can cover the pass is fast enough to cover the uh, backs and tight ends, and really does a good job of uh, of uh, run support. So. Hard hitter, I look for him to uh, start and do well in that. The other, when you're in the when the basic defense, if you're in a basic, well, I think Cheyenne Carter uh, plays that uh, next position. Now, Cheyenne Carter's played every position. He, he's played cornerback. He's played uh, he's played star. Uh, he's played uh, safety, free safety, strong safety, uh, and he's even played the money in the in the dime package. So, uh, I, I think Cheyenne Carter is a big asset to the to the. Uh, uh, defensive backfield and I thought that for a while but after hearing coach Saban talk about Shane Carter himself at, at, at fan day media day it really put uh, puts a different spin on this story you know I've always said Shane Carter has upside it was great but coach Saban said get, gave us a little insight into Shane Carter that I wasn't aware of he said Shane Carter was a student of the game he studied and knew uh, more, uh, more about the other team and opposing team, the strategies, the, content- the the tendencies, and he's able to affect the rest of his players. And Coach Saban made this statement, which I think is uh, probably a, a really big statement about James Carter. He said he's probably one of the one or two most intelligent football players on the team. And so he said he was going to make a great coach one day. So having him in the, in the game is like having another coach on the field. And so I think that really does well when we're in our basic defense, uh, playing against our basic defense package. He'll be on the field as a, as a safety. Now, we won't be in the basic defensive package a lot because we won't play teams that run the ball or run a, run a pro set much. So a lot of times we'll be in the, we'll be in the star uh, set and where Cheyenne Carter moves up to the star position. And, and, and when that happens, I think the, the, the free safety, Jared Maiden, uh, will be the one to come in and play in the free safety. I, I think he'll do a good job. I think uh, uh, he has showed some some flashes that he can play uh, in that position. Uh, he's, he's been in the program a long time, came in with Diggs. He's a senior, so I think he gets the opportunity to come in and, 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 and contribute as well. Uh, when you move over to the money position and bring another person in, then you got to look at who they're going to bring in. you got several sophomores that, that I think are going to contribute. Uh, you got Josh Job uh, at at cornerback. You got Eddie Smith at safety. Uh, you got uh, Daniel Wright, a redshirt sophomore at, at safety. 
Uh, and then another cornerback, you got uh, Jalen Armour Davis, uh, who had been a little banged up, but he comes back uh, as a redshirt freshman. So all of those add to the mix. I think that we, we've got a really, really good defensive backfield. And I would say that it, it's an upgrade over last year's defensive backfield. I think we need to make some changes. We need to make some improvements. And I think we've done that. So I look for overall the defensive backfield to be that coupled with our great offense, defensive line to be one of the things that really pressures uh, the, the other teams we play. And I can see this defensive backfield getting a lot of interceptions, a lot of turnovers, and, and, and really making a difference on, on the game day. Well, that's all uh, for today on our podcast. Again, I want to thank our listeners out there. You've been uh, continuing to, to listen to these, view them. You can check us out on dccapstonereport.com to get uh, some of our uh, uh, content there with the pictures and videos that Lance are doing and those wallpapers that I spoke about. Or follow me on Twitter at davidcott 50 that's David Cott 50. If you want to hear me on the radio on Tuesday mornings on the Martin Houston show at 100.9, Tide 100.9, uh, I'm on that show. If you want to tune in, they have a 100.9 app. If you're somewhere and don't get that local station, you can download the Tide 109 app or listen to it at Tide109.com uh, on Tuesday morning, those, uh, those radio shows at Martin Houston's. Well, until next week, this is DC with the DC Capstone Report.